Well, I wrestled a little bit uh, with how to uh, present the message this morning because the temptation is to uh, do the traditional uh, thing and uh, do the message on just the portion that Cherie read, uh, the calling of the twelve. But uh, as I begin to look it over, uh, it seemed to me that there's, though there are many good messages we could make out of that passage, uh, there's a larger context here, and I kind of wanted to take all of that in. And, you know, we've been uh, seeing how Jesus' ministry has been unfolding, and uh, the great joy that uh, it has brought to him and to others, but at the same time, it brought great consternation to some, didn't it? And great criticism to Jesus. So, uh, as I was uh, researching the message, um, it came to me that Christ's life as our lives could sort of be described uh, by the term the ecstasy and the agony. Now, some of you can identify with that. You've been in situations where everything started out wonderfully and you just couldn't see how anything could possibly go wrong with this relationship, with this career path, uh, with this church you found, whatever it is, everything was wonderful. And then something happened, didn't it? And sometimes it happens and it gets so bad that your ecstasy that you started out with becomes your agony. You ever have a baby? How wonderful that was! But they have this bad habit of turning into teenagers. <laughs> Present company accepted. <laughs> but you definitely go from the ecstasy to the agony, and hopefully the teenage years give way to young adulthood, and we move back towards the ecstasy a little bit. <laughs> but you may recognize that as a play on words from the, uh, the, the, bo the movie, the, the book was written in 1961, the movie 1965, uh, the proper title is The Agony and the Ecstasy. And of course, uh, it's about uh, Michelangelo and his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And, and for Michelangelo, that was definitely an agony and an ecstasy sort of event. Because you, one thing you have to realize here is, he did not want to do that. And the main reason he didn't want to do that is because he felt unqualified to do that. And the reason he felt unqualified to do that is because he fancied himself to be a sculptor, not a painter. And he, in fact, lobbied uh, Pope Julius II uh, to let Raphael paint the ceiling. But Pope Julius wanted Michelangelo to paint the ceiling. And by the way, Pope Julius is known as the warrior pope. Uh, it was not like what a pope today. Uh, he ruled with a sword, and he wielded that sword uh, quite well. And so uh, Michelangelo ended up painting the ceiling, but it was definitely an agony and an ecstasy event for him. Have you ever been called to do something you feel unqualified to do? I certainly don't feel qualified to be a pastor. I certainly don't even feel qualified to be a Christian. You know, we sang the amazing grace thing. I mean, would any of you stand before Jesus and say, well, you know, you're sure fortunate you picked me because I'm the best man for the job. I doubt it. We all shrink when Jesus calls us into ministry, don't we? And we all utter uh, the same refrain, oh, I'm, I'm not qualified to do that. Well, what about the... Uh, Twelve apostles, were they qualified? Uh, I don't know. But Jesus called them anyway, didn't he? Yeah. Now we're talking about this agony and ecstasy thing. And there's always a, a honeymoon period before things go bad. you know. And, and so it is in Jesus' ministry. It, it, it had gotten so good. It was so big that he couldn't even move. You, you see the pictures uh, on the news every once in a while of the paparazzi and they, they're on to some movie star or whatever and they just swarm them and they can't move. And it, it, That's got to be the pits. Well, that's the way it was for Jesus now. And so, he's got to get some help. 
So he continues to call his apostles. He realizes that what he's about to face, and we've already seen that he's faced a lot, but the opposition is going to intensify the nearer he gets to the cross, because that's, that's uh, Satan's uh, last gasp effort to keep him from going to the cross, because he knows it'll be over for him when he does. And so he's got to do something here, so he's going to call these 12 people to help him. Last, uh, well, not last week, but a few weeks ago, we prayed over Mike Marshawn as we ordained him as our newest elder. And I gave him a little plaque uh, that had been given to me years ago. And it was a quote from Chuck Swindoll. And maybe you remember. Uh, but here's what he said. And he was talking about leadership. But uh, you can talk about this for all of us as, as we engage in our various ministries. And Swindoll said this. He said, you are either the hero or the villain. You are greatly respected or you are virtually hated. And isn't that the way it is? many times in our lives. We, we start out with something and people think we're wonderful. And then as time goes on, we disappoint them or we have to correct them or something happens and then they think we're terrible. And that's the way it is in Jesus' ministry, right? He goes through and some think it's wonderful, some think it's terrible. So if we're going to make it, if we're going to keep our sanity and, and that going through life like this, we need a support group. We all need a support group. We, we need a small group of people that we can really depend on, that we can count on, that we can talk to, that we can go to for advice when we're struggling. When everybody's telling us, you're no good, you're not qualified, you're stupid, what are you doing that for? You need to have that close group that you can go to and they can speak into your life and say, you know what, those people are right. <laughs> <laughs> because they might be. At that point in your life, you may be getting off on the wrong track. So you need that trusted group that can tell you that. But you also need that trusted group to tell you, you know what, those people are all wet. You're, you're right on track. You keep on doing what you're doing. You persevere. See? You need honest people who know and respect you, whom you know and respect enough to accept that kind of criticism in your life. Or that kind of encouragement in your life, you see. So Jesus is going to gather these troops here. And uh, er, Cherie read the passage for us, so I won't read it again. But notice now, one thing about these groups. Even within our inner circle, some people will be closer to us than others. So you may have a circle of six people, but within that circle of six, there may be a couple of people that you are really close to. And that's okay. Now Jesus has already gathered five of his apostles, right? He's got the four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and then the beloved tax collector, Matthew. Now, why would he take, why would he pick them? Would you have picked them if you were going to go on the journey Jesus was going on? Would you want four fishermen and a tax collector? I think not. I would have wanted maybe some attorneys or some really top-notch soldiers or something like that. Not four fishermen and a tax collector. Jesus understands the magnitude of the battle he is about to be engaged in. And as we will shortly see, it's going to be fierce. Um, I like what it says here at the beginning, in verse 13. He went up to the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came. Now that's specific to the calling of the apostles, but isn't that the same thing he's done with us? He called us specifically and called us for a purpose. So who are we to say to him, I'm not qualified? 
you don't say, God, you made a mistake. Because that's what you're saying. When he calls you into a ministry and you say, you know, you get this false humility thing, and oh, I can't do that, I'm not qualified for that. You're telling God he made a mistake. And if I read the Bible correctly, God doesn't make mistakes. He calls whom he wants, and those he calls come. It's that simple. But again, why fisherman and tax collector? I think it's because he's trying to tell us something. And that something is, he can take whomever he wants, and they are qualified by the call of Jesus Christ. So he calls these twelve disciples. I want to share this with you. I, I just think this is hilarious. Uh, this is what would have happened if Jesus were here today and was choosing his 12, 12 uh, apostles. And what you would do today is, of course, you know, uh, every organization has, has its uh, uh, human resources department, which is usually the, the, the butt of a lot of jokes. Uh, but they all have a human resources department, and everybody has to go through them. And so uh, we're going to see here that Jesus has submitted the names of his people to the Jordan Management Consultants of Jerusalem. And here's, here's what they say. Thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you're consider considering for management positions in your new organization. All of them have taken our battery of tests, the results of which we've run through sophisticated computer analysis. We've also arranged personal interviews for each candidate with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. It is our staff's unanimous opinion that most of the nominees are lacking in qualifications for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. We recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. We find that Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. He seems far too impulsive to be put in a position of oversight. Andrew has absolutely no qualifications of leadership. The brothers James and John place personal interest above company loyalty, and they seem to be impatient with others due, with others. due to this impatience and ambition, they could one day become disgruntled employees. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that could tend to undermine morale. We feel it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. In closing, one of the candidates shows great potential. He is a man of ability, resourcefulness, and ambition. We highly recommend Judas Iscariot as your comptroller and right-hand man. All the other profiles are self-explanatory. Sincerely yours, Jordan Management Consultant. And humanly speaking, they're right. But Jesus is God. And he's calling them. He will equip them. And they will succeed as he desires. Remember this now. You are, call, you are qualified by Jesus' sovereign call. Not by your background, not by your abilities. None of these men were qualified by human standards. Just as Jesus chose particular individuals to be his apostles, so he specifically has chosen you and I to be a part of his church. Because when you become a Christian, you become a part of the church. Small, not this particular church, but Christ universal church church. In fact, the very word church, the Greek word ekklesia, that we translate church, is a compound word and you're pretty much familiar now when you see ek in front of a word you know that means out and call that oh means called and you put it together you get ekklesio, ekklesia and it means a called out ones. So when you're part of a church of the ecclesia, you are part of those who have been called out and placed into this body we call the church. 
And again, Jesus doesn't make mistakes. Now look what happens. He's chosen these guys. And the first thing that, that he does after choosing them is, he goes home, and a crowd gathered again so they could not even eat. There's the paparazzi deal going on. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. Now what are you supposed to, to receive when you go home? Hopefully you're, you're going to receive some, some love, some acceptance, uh, comfort if you're distressed, a place to rest if you're tired. Now Jesus comes home, he's tired, and his family says, he's nuts. Pretty supportive. Let me read verses 21 through 30. Now this is right after he's home, his family says he's crazy, and here's what he does. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Opposition is becoming a familiar theme, isn't it, throughout this ministry? You know, we wonder sometimes, why is life so hard? Why is being a Christian such a struggle? Well, there you go. It was hard for Jesus. It was a struggle for Jesus. It was one battle after another. And sometimes you feel like that's going on in your life, isn't it? You just get through one crisis, and here's another crisis. You just get one relationship straightened out, and there's another one that needs work. It's never ending. That's why we need to know that one day we'll step into eternity with Christ. And what do we have then? Those of you that were here for the series on Revelation, remember that the, the sea is no more. And you remember we talked about what that meant. And the sea to the, to the people that lived in the Middle East in that day represented chaos. It represented danger. It represented a threat. And it was constantly moving and going and in and out. But when Jesus sets up his kingdom, the sea is no more. And everything is peaceful. And isn't that what we desire in our lives? One day we will have it. Likely not here. But one day, we will. Opposition. His own family is opposed to him. It's interesting also, the, the word fan. Now, I know you're all great Seahawk fans, and you especially like Pete Carroll. <laughs> Not so much sometimes, huh? But if you are, if you have season tickets and you paint your face up and you yell and you scream and you do all that stuff they call you a real fan don't they and that has a positive connotation doesn't it if you're a real fan that's a good thing but what other word is there like that what word does fan come from fanatic exactly so, if you do all those things in the name of the Seahawks, or God forbid the Broncos, or, or who, sorry Mike, or whomever it is, you're considered a fan. That's a positive thing. But if you do that same stuff in the name of Jesus, what are you called? A fanatic. I, I, I love this thing I saw here a while back. I won't get it exactly right, but, but this guy that travels a lot, 
He says he has a special shirt he wears when he's traveling, when he's saying, I have to travel on the airlines. And, and it says on here, I love talking about Jesus. And he says, it's amazing. You can be, you, everybody leaves you alone. <laughs> and if they have a choice, they'll leave the seat next to you empty. <laughs> because they don't want to hear about Jesus. And if you tell them about Jesus, you aren't a fan of Jesus. You're one of those fanatics. Try it. And so, Jesus is a fanatic. He's nuts. Now, this had to be hurtful. We, we talk about how Jesus is fully God, but we also have to talk about how Jesus was fully human. And in his humanity, when your own family is ridiculing you like that, all of the big, big people in town are ridiculing you, criticizing you. That's got to hurt. That's got to, at the very best, it has to be demoralizing. So what's Jesus going to do? Well, maybe he'll just back off a little bit. Or maybe quit altogether. Isn't that what we do? Oftentimes, when things get hard, things get rough, well, we'll just back up. But the favorite thing I hear from Christians is, and I just want to slap them when I say this, and you hear it all the time, you can go ask any pastor, you, you just pick one at random, and I guarantee you he'll say, say the same thing. You say, well, pastor, how come it's always the same people doing everything? Those other people never do anything. It's always us. Well, so what? If God's called you to do it, and you've stepped up to do it, praise God. Those other folks are missing out. See, we talk all this time about, I've got my eyes riveted on Jesus, but I'm watching you to make sure you're doing as much as I am. You know? You know? It's nuts. So maybe that's what Jesus is going to do. Maybe he's going to look around and say, well, nobody else is talking about the kingdom of God. I'm doing all these miracles. Nobody appreciates it. Every time there's a work day, I show up. I'm always early. I stay late. Maybe I'll just quit showing up for work day. So what did Jesus do? He casts out an evil spirit, doesn't he? He continues to heal the sick. He goes right on with his mission. You want to criticize me? Criticize me. You want to call me nuts? Call me nuts. I've got a mission. God has given me this mission. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to see it through. Jesus shakes it off and continues ministering to those in need, healing and casting out demons. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he is possessed by Beelzebub and the prince of the demons. Wow. Doesn't that seem a little odd? Jesus is doing all this grand and wonderful stuff and the important people, the religious leaders who should have been the first to recognize what was going on, criticize him. Not only do they criticize him, they call him Satan himself. They accuse him of being possessed himself and of casting out demons in the name of Satan, through the power of Satan. Well, that tells us something, I think. And I think here's what it tells us. When people are coming against us for no good reason. You need to see beyond the flesh and blood person that's coming against you. And I'm, I'm not big on demon possession and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 where he says this, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. When you're being attacked for either doing good, for doing the right thing, or for no good reason whatsoever, yeah, there's a person there going like this, probably, 
But behind that person, the primal cause of that person's attack is Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And so it helps a little bit if you can understand it's not really that person. It's who's behind that person. It, it's like in marriage counseling. You, you, you tell people when there's, a, when there's a situation where one person uh, just constantly attacks the other person, usually it's not about the person they're, they're attacking at all. It's some problem within them. And you explain to the person being attacked that what you need to do when you're under attack is separate the two. They're not attacking you really because of what you did. They're attacking you because of who they are and what they're struggling with. Still doesn't, it doesn't make it right, but it helps you to cope when you understand where it's truly coming from. So they call him Satan himself. This is the harshest criticism they can come up with. They're accusing Jesus of being in league with the devil. And he responds forcefully, doesn't he? We just read it. And he tells them, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's a, a line that uh, has worked itself into many speeches, hasn't it, over the years. But it's true, isn't it? Uh, a marriage where the couple is divided over where they think the marriage should go probably isn't going to endure. A church where the congregation is divided over uh, what the church should be doing or what the pastor should be preaching or what kind of doctrine should be taught probably isn't going to endure. There's going to be a church split down the line somewhere. If you're at odds with your company, whatever that is, uh, eventually you and that company will probably part ways. That's just what happens when we're divided. And so Jesus says to them, no, you're the guys that are nuts. Because a house divided against itself can't stand. And if I'm casting out Satan in the name of Satan, that, that wouldn't make any sense. So probably what you're all thinking about is verse 29. Because it's gotten a lot of press over the years, hasn't it? And what did Jesus say there? He says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but he is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And we call it the unpardonable sin. There's another question pastors get universally. Is, well, well, pastor, what if I've committed the unpardonable sin? You ever ask that question, at least in your mind? Sure. A lot of people have. And what is the unpardonable sin? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Well, what's that? Yeah. The unpardonable sin is a person, a person who has committed the unpardonable sin, is a person who is irredeemable as he attributes the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. He is one who rejects the work of the Spirit in their lives. Okay. So if they're irredeemable because they've rejected the work of the Holy Spirit, can it ever apply to a Christian? No. Because Christians have been redeemed. We have listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit in one way or another, and we have come into God's forever family. Uh, Jesus said it this way in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So it can't include any Christians. Can it include anyone whom God is going to call into his kingdom but hasn't yet? No. Because they're going to hear the Spirit's call in answer. Jesus says, I know my sheep and they hear my voice. You see. So, don't worry about it. I don't know who's committed the unpardonable sin or if anybody. I don't know. But if you're a Christian or if you are going to become a Christian and who knows who that is, only God knows that, don't worry about it. One who rejects the Spirit in their lives. 
So we've gathered a great group because we're going to face this great opposition as Jesus has done. But now it takes one more thing if we're going to persevere. And that is we need a great commitment. And commitment's not uh, really a real popular idea sometimes in our society, is it? We don't want to make a commitment. You know, uh, we, we don't commit to things like we used to. But if we're going to succeed in a way that we would like at living the Christian life, we have to have a great commitment. If we are going to be able to stand against such great opposition, we must have a great commitment both to God and to His people. To God and to His people, the church. Now, that's not real popular. Uh, preaching commitment to the church. You know, people will say, well, no, no, no. It's not about the church. But it is about the church. And we say, well, it's about the universal church. Well, yeah, it's about the universal church. But what's the universal church made up of? A bunch of local churches. And so we need to have a great commitment to those churches. In these verses, let me read them for you, 31 through 35. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Now these are the folks that just called him nuts. Uh, a few verses ahead. Remember who we got here. They are seeking you. And Jesus answered them and said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my mother, brother, sister, and mother. Now, this little portion of scripture is often uh, greatly misunderstood. Uh, what Jesus isn't doing here, he isn't repudiating his biological family. What he's doing is, he is expanding that definition of who brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers are, now to include all the people of God. Those are my brothers and sisters. It's not just limited to my biological family anymore. I've told the story before. When I was little, I was, I was raised in an, an old-time Pentecostal setting. And until I was 10 or 11 years old, I didn't know Christians had first names. Because everybody was, you know, it, it, would, it would be like Brother Fane, Brother Abbott, Sister So-and-so, Smith, whatever it is. Uh, that's what they called each other. And I didn't understand that, but they're, what they're doing is they're doing what Jesus says here. They're recognizing each other as blood relations. Are we blood related? Are we? Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We, we sing about the blood. We, just, we preach about the blood. We, we, Jesus shed his blood for us. We're blood relatives. And that's what he's saying here in these verses. And he's saying because of that relationship, he has made a commitment to us, hasn't he? And he took that commitment to the point of death on a cross. So that we might never experience death. He's expanding now from, from his five, the four fishermen in Matthew, to the twelve, and now he's expanding to as many as believe. That's my family. That's my group. That's my bunch that I run with. Jesus is committed to them and they to him. And again, why is that so important? Because Satan's number one ground of attack whether he wants to destroy a marriage, a church, a career, a corporation, whatever it is Satan is setting out to destroy, his number one ground of attack is disunity. I'm going to create some kind of a rift in this group, whether it's a group of two or a group of 2,000, and eventually that rift will destroy it. And I'm sure you can all 
look back in your memory banks and find examples of that. In verse 24, he says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And that's so true. I was watching the news last week and they were, they were interviewing uh, Dr. Ben Carson. And he said this. He said, the problem in Washington, D.C., not state, he said, the problem in Washington, D.C. is they are more interested in being Republicans or Democrats than in being Americans. You know? And that's so true. And sometimes in the history of the church, we've done the same thing, have we not? we become more interested in being Baptists or Presbyterians or Catholics or Protestants or whatever than we are in being Christians. Same thing in a marriage. I'm going to look out for my interest and she can look out for her interest or vice versa. And, and we get more worried about taking care of our little corner of the marriage than taking care of the marriage. In fact, I read somewhere not too long ago, some psychologist had written, and he said that he was talking about uh, things that tend to uh, make for a lasting marriage, and he said that couples that have a lasting marriage tend to view their marriage as almost a third thing. There is her, there is him, and there is the marriage. And I thought that was rather interesting. Because, and, and it really I think that's healthy if you think about it because we each have to have our own space. But that marriage is more important than our own space. So that means sometimes I have to give up some of my space. Sometimes you have to give up some of your space. And it, it's the same if we're in a church. It's the same if we're in a corporation. It, it's all the same. Now some of those are at different levels, I realize. But it's the same principle. So, here's what I want you to do. I want you to just take a moment. I'm going to wrap this up here. Take a moment and consider your commitments. It, it just do a little inventory of them. Do a little checkup, you know. It, how's your commitment to God? How, how's your commitment to God's people? How's your commitment to your marriage? To your employer or your employees if you are the employer? And as you think about that, just to ask God to maybe reinforce it where it needs to be reinforced. And he'll do that. And remember, it's God we keep our eyes on. And it's our commitments that we keep. And as we go through life that way, we certainly won't escape opposition. We may even engender more criticism. But we will be able to say to God, I did the best I could to keep this commitment. So just take a moment, bow your head, and do a little business with God, and I'll, I'll wrap us up with a prayer. Lord, it's been uh, good to talk about uh, you this morning and to see what a great commitment you had to us to continue your ministry in, in spite of great opposition from people you didn't know at all to the people you knew the most intimately, your own family. And yet you never wavered. You never for a minute thought about quitting. But you moved right on. You continued your ministry. You continued healing the sick. You continued, continued to cast out demons. And so, Lord, as Christians, we make commitments. And the greatest one, of course, is to you. So I would pray that your Holy Spirit would just empower us to go ahead and be fanatics, perhaps, about serving you to be fanatical about our commitment to you. And then your word is plain in various places that when we 
make a commitment to someone else or to something else, we are to keep that commitment if at all possible. And so help us, Lord, to think more about that. The commitments we've made to spouses, the commitments we've made to employers, to institutions, to the church. And Lord, let us keep those commitments with a fanatical zeal so that the world can see that we are just a little bit different. And now, oh God, thank you for your word, for showing us that we need others in our lives and that that's a good thing. Now I pray that you give everyone that came this morning a wonderful week. Give them opportunity and the courage to invite someone to come with them next Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.